Hello. Um, my name's Peter, uh, and I'm going to be lecturing differential equations this term. So the, uh, the lecture notes and problem sheets and everything for this course are uh, in the usual place. And there are also quite a few uh, good textbooks uh, for this material. And again, some of those are mentioned on the website as well. Um, so I'd recommend you look out for those. Um, now, just one quick sort of general point. Um, quite often, it might be that I write down, you can see my handwriting's not that great. Maybe I'll write down something that you can't read or that doesn't seem to make sense. Or I might say something that just, you know, yeah, doesn't make sense. So if that happens. Um, it'd be great if you would just yell out and ask me a question rather than starting a chat amongst all your neighbours. So I don't know about you, I find it really distracting if other people are sort of chatting all around you. So, so yeah, if you have any questions or any queries or any points, then just sort of shout out and ask me um, rather than starting a conversation going. Okay? Uh, all right, good. So most of this course uh, is about second order linear boundary value problems. Um, and I'm going to uh, use BVPs as shorthand for that. And um, I'm just going to do a few examples just to sort of illustrate what some of the issues are. Um, here's the first one, by the way. So here and sort of henceforth, I'm going to use a prime as shorthand for differentiation. hope that's okay. Uh, so this is a very simple boundary value problem. Uh, I've got to solve a second order ODE and I've got two boundary conditions. And we can easily solve this using elementary methods um, from the first year. So here we go. Uh, so how do we solve an equation like this? I guess we have to look for a particular solution and then the complementary function. Okay. In this case, the particular integral is just one, right? Easy. Okay, so that uh, should be standard stuff from last year. Um, so the general solution is the sum of a particular integral and a complementary function. In this complementary function, we have two arbitrary constants. Okay. All right, that's straightforward. And then to work out what C1 and C2 are, we just have to plug in the boundary conditions. Okay. Oh, okay. Also, I'm going to use BCs for boundary conditions. Again, hope that's okay. Oh, and here's one I worked out earlier. So. Okay. Easy, right? Everyone happy so far? Yeah. All right, it is going to get harder, I promise. Here's uh, example two. Um, so I'm going to replace that one by tan x. Uh, tan, I guess, isn't defined if I let x be too big, so let's just have... So I'm just going to do this on x go from 0 to pi over 4. So uh, in principle, it's exactly the same kind of boundary value problem. I've got second order equation, two boundary conditions. Um, but good luck spotting the particular integral for this, right? So in principle, the same method should work, but how are we supposed to find the particular integral for this? Right. 
There's somebody trying to spot it now. <laughs> if anyone does it by the end of the lecture, I'll be uh, impressed. Um, right, example three. So it's the same uh, ODE that we started with. Uh, and I've just tweaked the boundary conditions slightly. So instead of y prime to pi is 2, now I've got y of pi is 2. Um, principle, same approach will work, right? No, this, this problem has no solutions. Right? And you can easily check that yourselves. If you try to follow the particular integral plus complementary function approach, you just end up with a contradiction. It's impossible to satisfy both those boundary conditions. Okay. Uh, so finally, uh, I'm going to do the same problem. I'm just going to change this 2 to a 1, so exactly the same. Okay. So everything's the same apart from that final bound condition. And this uh, problem has an infinite number of solutions. So it's got non-unique solution, and actually I'll just write this down. So just 1 plus a sine x works for any a. Okay. So this is just supposed to illustrate uh, what the issues are with boundary value problems. Um, and so I'm just going to note this down. What are the main questions that we're going to be trying to answer in this bit of the course? Um, and you see there's a couple of issues that we encountered here. Um, the first is that um, unless the right-hand side is something very simple, um, how are we going to spot a particular integral? Right? And, and isn't there a way to sort of just construct the particular integral? And the answer is, yeah, there is. Can I use PI for particular integral? Is that going to upset anyone? So, if I call that star. Without somehow trying to sort of guess it or spot it, how can we actually construct it in a systematic way? And then the second question, which perhaps is more important, is um, when does a bounded value problem like this have a solution? And when is the solution unique? Okay, everything clear so far? Okay, right. Um, so first things first, I'm just going to introduce some uh, notation, sort of jargon, that I'm going to be using throughout the course. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so I'm mostly going to be considering second order um, differential equations. There'll be some exceptions, but mostly. Oh, 
Oh, yes. Again, ODE is all the differential equation. Um, so this is a bit abstract at the moment. That thing in the front is supposed to be a curly L. Maybe it looks a bit like a 2. It's supposed to be a curly L. All right. <coughs> and let me just define what L is. So this is a sort of the most general second order linear differential operator that we could have. So it's uh, some linear combination of the second first derivatives of y and y itself. Um, and these p2, p1, p0 are kind of any old functions we like. I guess I'm going to assume they're continuous at least. And in practice, you know, in all the examples we'll do, they will be, um, almost always, they'll be analytic, in fact. Um, and I'm going to assume that y is differentiable enough times for this to make sense. Okay. And again, in practice, uh, we're nearly always going to be looking for solutions that are analytic. <clears throat> um, and then the final thing, um, which might be a bit mysterious to start with, is I'm going to assume that P2 is not zero. So that's... Um, by that, I mean it's not equal to zero anywhere. Not just that it's not the zero function, but it's everywhere non-zero, I think. <clears throat> and uh, this, maybe you haven't thought about this before, but maybe you can see if P2 was zero anywhere, then this second order differential equation would have kind of turned into a first order one. And that actually co would correspond to a singular point of this ODE. Again, we're going to come back to that later in the course. Okay. <clears throat> Just check where I've got to. Okay, now there's um, two sort of cases of this that we're going to, um, it's going to be helpful to separate those out. So firstly, if f is zero, then this equation is called homogeneous, right? And if f is not zero, it's called inhomogeneous or non-homogeneous. So okay, and we're going to label those separately because we're going to be referring to those two different cases a lot, okay? So if f is the zero function, that's called in, that's called homogeneous. God, I better get that right. So so that is going to be referred to throughout as h for the homogeneous problem. Okay. And the case where f is not zero is called inhomogeneous. And for some reason, this conventionally is enabled n uh, for sort of non-homogeneous. Okay. 
Is that okay? Is that clear? Yeah? Um, all right, and I'm going to re be referring quite a lot to these two different cases, H and N. Right? Now, in differential equations one, last term, you would mostly have been looking at uh, what are called initial value problems. All right? No surprise to find there's an acronym for that as well, um, IVPs. Um, so what I mean by that is if I've got a second order ODE, what I would normally do is give you what Y and Y primed are at some point. So typically, So at some point x equals a, I would tell you what y and y primed are, and then you've got to work out what y is everywhere else. Right? Now for that problem, um, you can use Picard's theorem um, from differential equations one. And it guarantees that uh, a unique solution exists, at least locally. Okay? Oh, at least locally, provided p2 is not zero. And maybe you can see why now, if you try to apply Picard's theorem, if p2 was zero, you'd have a problem. Okay. Wait. Now, Picard's theorem guarantees uh, local um, existence and uniqueness. And in fact, for linear equations like this, um, you probably might remember this from you know, a term ago, uh, that actually it satisfies a global Lipschitz condition and you can show the solution exists everywhere. Again, provided P2 is not zero. Yeah. Um, so in fact, provided P2 is not zero, the existence and uniqueness are global. <coughs> okay. <clears throat> but for boundary value problems, that's not true. Okay. And I've already shown you two examples where that's not true, where you, instead of specifying y and y prime at one point, we have boundary conditions at two different points, and you can either get non-existence or non-uniqueness. Okay. <coughs> okay. <coughs> okay, so I'm just going to quote some basic uh, properties, uh, again, from elementary, from last year, basically, um, or even from A-level, I think. Um, and the first is, uh, if I've got a second order um, in homogeneous ODE, well, you could do this trick that I did in the very first example. You could break down the general solution into a particular integral plus a complementary function. Okay. So I'm going to break it up like this, so I can write the general solution as a particular integral, which I call YPI, plus the complementary function, um, which I call YCF. And what do I mean by that? So YPI uh, is any function at all that satisfies the um, inhomogeneous problem. Is 
Is that okay? So the particular integral is any solution that you can find by any means necessary of the inhomogeneous problem. And YCF is the general solution of the homogeneous problem, where you've got rid of the F on the right-hand side. Okay? Hopefully that all um, has some sort of familiarity to it. Okay? Um, so the second thing, uh, what about that uh, YCF thing, the complementary function? Well, for a second-order linear ODE, um, the space of solutions of the homogeneous problem is a vector space of dimension 2. Okay? So what I mean by that is that um, the complementary function I can write as, um, I can write just in terms of two basis functions, basically. There you go, it's exactly, I guess, what I did for that very simple first example. Um, so... Uh, C1 and C2 are in arbitrary constants. And then Y1 and Y2, I guess, are any sort of basis functions for the vector space. And basically, there are any two solutions that are linearly independent. Okay? Is that okay? This is more or less familiar? Yeah. All right. <coughs> Any questions so far? No? Good. All right. Um, so I'm just going to say a bit more about linear independence, because, uh, again, this is going to be kind of important uh, going forward. Um, and I can see my writing is getting smaller. I have to nag me if I uh, keep doing that. Um, and linear independence is very closely related to um, a thing called the Rontzkian, and I'm going to say a bit about that as well. Okay, so we remember what it means uh, for two functions, or in general, two elements of a vector space um, to be linearly, linearly independent or linearly dependent. I guess I maybe it's easy to write down the situation for them to be linearly dependent. Um, So these two functions would be linearly dependent. Basically, if you could take some linear combination of them that adds up to zero, some non-trivial linear combination of them. Okay, so if there exists some uh, constant C1 and C2, not both zero, uh, such that C1, Y1 plus C2, Y2 adds up to the zero function. Okay. <clears throat> and I guess they're linearly independent if um, 
no such C1 and C2 exist. Okay. Um, so that's just the definition of what we mean by linearly dependent. Now, let's suppose this was true. So let's suppose they are linearly dependent. And then, remember, I'm assuming that y1 and y2 are twice differentiable, actually. So I can certainly differentiate this with respect to x. So, um, so if C1, Y1 plus C2, Y2 is zero, then also it must, they must be true for the derivatives of Y1 and Y2 as well. Right. <clears throat> okay. So actually now I could think of this as a, like a linear system of equations for C1 and C2. Right. And I guess we know then that um, we can get non-trivial solutions uh, for C1 and C2, even only if the determinant of that matrix is zero. Okay. Okay. Um, and that determines what's called the Rontzkian. Okay. So, um, so that's what we mean by the Rontzkian, uh, the determinant of that uh, matrix. And um, here, I guess, I'm going to slip between, it's in a slight abuse of notation, I guess, but um, here I've kind of expressed W as being a sort of bilinear functional of Y1 and Y2. So if you give it two functions, it spits out another function. Okay. Um, but it's also helpful sometimes just to think of W as being a function of X. Okay. Really. So what I mean by that is if I actually now evaluate y1 and y2, then I get w as a function of x. Is that okay? So it's just kind of two different ways of thinking of the same um, quantity, really. Is that clear? Um, so I guess what I've argued then is that um, <coughs> the if y1 and y2 are linearly dependent, then the Rontzkian must be zero. Okay, that's what I've shown. Yeah. <coughs> Again, I hope you don't mind this. If I write LD for linearly dependent, I hope that's clear. <coughs> Just to save myself some uh, uh, ink. 
<coughs> uh, so we've shown that if that's true, that implies that the Ronskian is zero. Okay. And I guess we can also use the sort of contrapositive of that. So Um, I hope this isn't going to upset anyone. And so if W is not zero, then Y1 and Y2 must be linearly independent. Okay, and again, I'll use Li for that. Is that clear? That's sort of turning the previous identity on its head. <coughs> now, it would be really nice if we could um, turn that implication into an even only if, uh, but it's not quite true um, in the other direction. Um, and actually, you can quite easily come up with counterexamples. And so, um, uh, here's a counterexample. So here is two functions that are sort of defined in a piecewise way. And actually, the ex kind of examples that you can easily dream up for this, generally of, of this sort of form. Okay? So these are functions that are, you can easily check they're linearly independent. Um, so the first thing is, these two functions, although they're defined in this funny piecewise way, they're actually three times differentiable. Uh, obviously something funny happens at the origin, but it's only the fourth derivative that's discontinuous. Okay. And then the second thing you can easily check, uh, sort of an exercise if you don't believe me, is that these two functions are linearly independent. So it's impossible to find a non-trivial combination of them that adds up to the zero function. Okay. Um, but finally, the real killer is that the Ronskin of these two functions is zero. So although the Ronskin is zero, these functions are linearly independent. So it means we can't uh, put this implication um, the other way. <coughs> okay. All right. But there is, so in general, um, this implication doesn't go in both directions. But in the case, luckily for us, I guess, in the cases we're really interested in, when y1 and y2 are not just any two old functions that you pull out of the air, like these two, but they are actually two solutions of a second order ODE. And in that case, this implication does go in both directions. Okay. So y1 and y2 are solutions of a second order ODE, then the implication does go both ways.
<coughs> um, all right, so I'm just I'm going to prove this. Um, so I'm going to state a proposition. It's a proposition of two halves. So, let's take y1 and y2 to be any two solutions of our second order homogeneous uh, ODE. And then there's two things uh, that we can then say. Um, the first thing is, um, so the Ronskian, basically either it's zero everywhere or it's zero nowhere. Uh, why does that matter? Because I guess it wouldn't make sense for two functions to be kind of linearly independent in some places but not in others. Yeah. And then the second thing is that Actually, I was going to do, say it this way. So W is zero if and only if Y1 and Y2 are linearly dependent. Right. Okay. <coughs> okay. Um, so let me just prove these one at a time, then that'll, I'll probably wrap up after that. Um, so, for the first bit, we know that y1 and y2 are both solutions of our homogeneous ODE. So, let me just write that out explicitly. So we know that y1 and y2 both satisfy the same ODE. All right. um, so the way I think about this um, is I now I want to eliminate this P0 term. Okay? So that's sort of my little way of remembering what to do here. Okay, so what I mean is I'm going to do y1 times this one minus y2 times this one. Okay. Is that clear? So I've sort of done it, yeah. Okay, so do y1 times the first one minus y2 times the second one. Right. And now this, right, this is the Ronskin right here. Okay. Um, and actually, this is the derivative of the Ronskin. So if you imagine differentiating this with respect to x, you see the first derivatives cancel, you get y1 prime, y2 prime, minus y2 prime, y1 prime, and you just end up with the second derivatives. Okay. And so actually W satisfies this first order ODE. Okay. And actually you can easily solve that ODE. <clears throat> mm. 
Okay. So you can either think about this as being like an integrating factor or by you know, taking this term over the other side and separating the variables. Um, you can easily solve that, again, using elementary methods. Okay. Again, note, we need P2 not to be zero. Okay. All right. And now we know that exponential um, can't ever be zero. All right. So either this constant is zero or it isn't. If the constant is zero, then w is zero everywhere. If the constant isn't zero, then w is zero nowhere. Is that okay? Okay, so either W is zero everywhere or it's not zero everywhere. Is that okay? Um, all right, for the second part, um, we've done that one, okay, um, so the thing we need to do is the other way, we need to do uh, that way, okay, that's what remains to be done. Um, so we've done the... Um, so what I need to do is the sort of implication going in the right direction. So let's suppose W is zero, and I'm trying to show that then Y1 and Y2 have to be linearly dependent. Okay. Right. right. So um, first things first, I'm going to assume that Y1 is not the zero function. Okay, because if it was, then y1 and y2 would trivially be linearly dependent. Okay. Okay. Is that okay? Because you could just take c2 to be zero and c1 to be anything. Yeah. Um, Okay, so if y1 is not the zero function, then there must exist some value of x where y1 is not zero. Is that okay? Now, here's the trick. I'm going to define y of x to be this particular linear combination of y1 and y2. So it's y1 of a, y2 of x minus y2 of a, y1 of x. Okay. Then what we can see is that if I put x equals a, then this y is 0. That's clear, right? <coughs> And also, actually, if I differentiate this and then put x equals a, then I get uh, the Ronskian evaluated at x equals a. Okay. And by assumption, the Ronskian is zero. Right. Um, so you've got this function, and both y and its first derivative 
um, a zero at x equals a, and also because it's a linear combination of y1 and y2, um, y satisfies the homogeneous equation. So it satisfies this second order differential equation with the z on the right hand side. So then, by Picard's theorem, um, the solution of this initial value problem is, exists and is unique, and it's just zero, okay? Okay, so I've got this homogeneous ODE with zero initial conditions. The solution of that problem is just y equals zero. And by Picard's theorem, that solution is unique. Right. And that then tells us that there does exist a non-trivial combination of y1 and y2 that adds up to zero. Okay. So I think that's all for today. Uh, so tomorrow, I'm uh, going to get on to more um, actual solving problems, um, actually more techniques for solving things.